Welcome to the Grade 9 experiment. This term we're doing a student experiment as our major assignment for the term where you have to identify some unknown samples that you've been given based on the reactions that we've done in class. So, the purpose, purpose of this video is to understand the major assessment tasks you've got to do this term. By the end of this, you should be able to begin working on your planning for your student experiment. Firstly, what is science? So just to put in context why we're actually doing this thing, what are we actually doing when we do science? Now I know we're doing chemistry in particular, but I guess what I'm asking is what is science all about? Essentially, it's to explain the universe. We want to explain all parts of the universe that we possibly can, and obviously that's a, what seems like a never-ending journey, but we keep working our way towards it. And that's what science is trying to do, understand everything in the universe. This is often a very, fairly difficult thing to do. So for example, our first point there, we could predict the tides with great accuracy before we really understood what was causing it, before we understood how it was caused by the gravity and the earth and the moon and the motion of these objects. Um, similar to this, since uh, Isaac Newton published his work in uh, 1687 describing how gravity works, we've been able to calculate gravitational force with a lot of accuracy. But as far as what actually causes it, hasn't yet been proven. In some cases, we think it might be particles called a gravitron, which is a, a particle that would make this force happen. But that's not really uh, proven yet. Sometimes some people think it might be a curvature of space time that causes gravitational effects, but we really don't understand yet. Just an example of just something we don't really know, but we can still kind of understand. And we're still working towards explaining exactly why that happens. Another example here, the placebo effect. The placebo effect is where you take a drug, you think you're taking the drug, but instead of a proper tablet with the functional uh, chemical in it, you're just taking a, like a sugar pill or something like that, a pill that will do nothing. You think you're taking the real pill, you're taking absolutely nothing of value, but it still has effect on your body as though you had taken the real drug. That's what's known as the placebo effect. We understand it, we've studied it a lot, but again, we don't really understand why it occurs. All right, let's have a look at what scientists actually do. Scientists tend to do either pure scientific research or industrial research, or what we call applied research. Scientists can move between the two areas, but there's kind of these two sort of different streams. So if we look at pure research, Generally, these sorts of scientists work at a university or a research institution of some sort. And what they're doing is they're pushing the boundaries of what our knowledge is. They're trying to discover new knowledge. All right. So for example, when we looked at an acid plus a base is a neutralization reaction and it forms a salt plus water, that was a standard reaction. That's kind of like the pure scientific side of things. But when we actually do something with it, it starts to become applied science, which starts to be this next area. So industrial research or applied science is probably a more general name for it, is how we use that information to do stuff. All right? uh, for example, pure science might be looking at the, uh, electrons and the fact that they've got a negative charge and the fact that they can move and flow. But the applied science is how can we use that to make an electrical circuit to run a light or something like that? So how do we use that pure science for some element of our lives. Sometimes um, when it's more industrial research, it starts to look like contract research. For example, a scientist might be contracted or an organization like CSIRO does this quite a lot where they're contracted to other companies to do research into a particular area to help a particular company with some problem they've got. To give you an example, um, I used to work with uh, CSIRO and they used to do sort of contract research with various places. One place that we did it was uh, with the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Corporation. They built lots of big sort of hydroelectric dams and so on. And they were building a dam over in, uh, in Africa. And the government over there where they were building this hydroelectric plant and this dam wanted to know what a worst case scenario was. And said, well, what happens if that dam collapses? So what they, um, what they did was they came to CSIRO and the CSIRO scientists and mathematicians modelled 
the fluid dynamics of how those particles would, uh, those, those water molecules would flow if the dam collapsed and how that would interact with the surrounding environment, the hills and so on. And they were able to predict with a lot of accuracy, for example, that this particular village downstream has, say, two minutes notice until the water hits them, whereas the next village down might have 10 minutes and the next village down might have 20 minutes notice. So they were doing that sort of research so they knew what was going on. So they took that pure science about how um, you mathematically model the um, fluids and liquids and so on moving and applied it to that particular situation. That was an example of contract research. Uh, but other large companies that you've probably heard of definitely have scientists doing all sorts of research and engineers and so on, and there's a few I've got listed on the screen there. Obviously at the moment, we're in the middle of coronavirus. There's a good example of applied research where they take the knowledge of how viruses operate and how you can develop a vaccine and package it all up and work out how you can make billions of doses of that vaccine to protect people from the, uh, from the coronavirus. Incidentally, I should say, when you're looking at applying for universities, if you're looking in the scientific field, you often see things like a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Applied Science. And the difference is these two areas I've just outlined. The Bachelor of Science tends to be more of the pure science, and the Applied Science is this sort of industrial research side. Well, not so much industrial research, but how do we apply that pure science to particular situations to help out our lives? All right, so your task. You're going to get three samples, um, and you've got to identify what they are. So my question is, is this pure research or is this applied science? The pure research is understanding what the characteristic reactions are, things like bubbling carbon dioxide through lime water will turn it milky. The applied science, and what makes this applied science is you have to use those for a particular task. And in this case, we're identifying our unknown samples. And what we're sort of mirroring here is the sorts of um, assessment expectations that you might have if you go on with uh, science in grade 11 and 12. So here's our checkpoints. Week three, we're handing out the task. Week seven is your draft. That's the start of week seven. And the start of week eight, you have your final uh, draft due that you have to hand in online. Note the conditions that you've got. We've got a few weeks of class time to do this. You do have a word limit. Don't go over that. Whilst you do the experiments in class as a group, the write-up is an individual task and everybody has to have their own write-up. Here's our list of chemicals on the screen here that we have to uh, identify and you'll be given three that are just labelled A, B and C from this list here or here. So you get three unknown samples and it pays to start thinking what are the properties of those solutions that help you identify them. So think, think sort of through the process. How can a clear liquid be identified? You know, and if you look at that list, some of them are acids, some of them are bases, and some of them are neutral. So what would you do? You probably start with a pH test and then start going from there. We've done lots of different experiments and there's some examples there. We've done them in our workbook. They come from the text and so on. Lots of different examples of characteristic reactions. They're the things you need to have a look at. The little workbooklet that we've given you uh, helps out quite a lot with your research and planning and writing down your results and so on. So I do encourage you to look at that. However, that is not your final um, report that is due. You have to write up your final report and we'll have a different uh, set of instructions for that to help you out. So identifying a colourless liquid. As I said, the uh, acid base in, um, pH test is probably the first one to divide our groups into three categories. So there's probably the easy place to start. Um, there are other tests for acids, so whilst you may do your pH test, you can do react it with metals such as magnesium to form the hydrogen ga gas, which you test for in the pop test. You can react it with a carbonate, which is like marble chips, which produces carbon dioxide. There's a characteristic reaction that you should know for that one. How do we identify carbon dioxide? We bubble it through lime water and it turns milky. One of our unknowns is a carbonate which is obviously this reaction here. Although instead of adding a carbonate, 
You do the reverse. You add the acid, and you'll work out that it's a carbonate. But when you do the pH for that guy, you'll see he's a bit different. Obviously, taste is not something we would do in this particular scenario. Is it possible that you could use taste in identifying a chemical? Yes, it's possible. Will you do that at school? Absolutely not. So as you can see, there's a few heap of tests we've done, and it pays to start to think about what are the properties of these particular unknown samples to work out which way you're going to go. And think about the most efficient order. And just a hint to get you started, pH is definitely the easiest one to start with. You've got this list of other um, in, uh, materials here. So if you want to do things like uh, flame tests and things like that, you know, add your magnesium to test for your acids and so on. All right, barium chloride will form a precipitate with some particular substances. That's up to you. Page two of your workbook has a little safety thing. You must fill this thing in. You must fill this thing in and show it to your teacher. All right. Um, this particular table, when you fill it in, you can use literally copy and paste into your final report. But have a think about what you're going to do. I mean, for example, I've just mentioned hydrogen gas. So for example, so you can make hydrogen gas that's going to have some issues. Why? Because it's flammable. All right, so what's your precaution? All right, you only make it in small quantities. All right. Now that sort of there is a fairly basic answer and wouldn't get you many marks. There's also another hazard in that we're using glass test tubes. What's the issue there? It could explode. So you don't want to use a stopper. All right. You don't want to point it up from, at people. So point away from people. All right. The more you add here, the closer and closer you get yourself to an A-level answer. Okay, So just writing one point for each thing, that's sort of barely scraping a C. But if you start to put some more detail like I have on the screen here, you're getting closer and closer to an A-level answer. All right, you should have a clear plan before you will do, do any of the um, experimentation. All right, So make sure you have a good idea of like a, a flow chart. Think of if your first test is, for example, a pH, what's it going to do? It's going to give you acids, it's going to give you bases, and it's going to give you neutral substances. What are you going to do from there? One of our acids, for example, is vinegar. It has a characteristic smell, so you might smell it. How would you identify the other two acids? And so on. And you're going to have various answers under all of these ones here. Okay? A flowchart like that is probably a good place to write out in your little workbook to help you get started. You must do this sort of planning before you get any further. That's a little bit more about the uh, actual write-up and what each section's got to be in terms of word limits and so on, and I'll give you more information about that one later. So, you should have understood what our major practical task is, and you should be able to get your planning done and start working. Did we achieve our aims? We certainly did. All right, thanks for coming.